Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we will be discussing AOL, the rise of its empire, and then its eventual fall from grace. Here you will find everything you need to know about this once world-renowned empire. But before we get into the details, don't forget to like this video and click the subscribe button. It really helps the channel out. With that being said, let's get right into it. It is hard to imagine what the landscape of the internet was before Google became the behemoth that it is today. But what if I told you that there was something before Google was the dominant online service provider? Picture what it was like to have almost complete control on one of the most important and up-and-coming industries at the time. To have such a position would naturally mean that you were at the top of the pyramid. You were at the peak of the world, but against all odds, you managed to lose everything. Such is the story of AOL, the visionary of modern internet as we know it. During the 80s, the world wasn't the same place as we know it now to be. Internet wasn't a thing back then, and the computers of that time were not connected to each other. They existed independent of each other, but it's not like networks weren't a thing, though. The handful of networks which did exist at the time were exclusive to scientists or highly important individuals, as well as being used in the military up to some extent. This is why back in 1983, launching an internet service was a huge undertaking. But Bill Von Meister believed he was up to the challenge. The company he created at the time was GameLine, which was a service that would let people rent games for their Atari VCS, better known as Atari 2600, through connecting to a dial-up connection. Although the idea was innovative, it was a bit too late, since 1983 wasn't exactly the best time to be associated to the video game industry thanks to the great video game recession at the time which nearly demolished console gaming. This was unfortunate for GameLine, but this meant that it didn't have much of a chance. During this recession, the video game industry was heavily affected, and in just two short years, the industry reduced in size by more than 95%. By the time 1985 rolled around, GameLine was as good as dead. Bill left the company as he thought this was a fruitless endeavor and he moved on. But the company's marketing director, Steve Case, had different plans in mind. He believed that GameLine could be brought back to life, and he and several of his colleagues adapted the setup left behind by GameLine to the Commodore 64. It is important to keep in mind that the Commodore 64 was one of the most popular computers in the market at that time. The company was rebranded to be Quantum Link, and Case and the others started working to increase its functionality by the day. Not soon after, the company wasn't just a game network, but one could say that it was kind of a prototype to the internet that we know today. This is because you could do so much on it, like chatting with other users, sending and receiving emails, as well as reading the news. The decision to make the shift from the console market to the computer market was a very smart one. This is because the console market was in shambles, but the computer market was going through a boom, becoming the reason why Quantum Link became so successful. Their enormous success even forced Apple to approach them, who desired a similar service for their own computing infrastructure. The company agreed to develop for Apple as well, and in 1988, Apple Link was launched. Soon after, Steve Case introduced PC Link for computers which were compatible with the IBM infrastructure. PC Link was doing great due to the influx of IBM compatibles in the market at the time. On the other hand, the deal with Apple didn't go so well, since Apple was unable to transfer data from their previous servers. Fortunately, the contract had a $2.5 million penalty provision that Steve Case was more than willing to accept. Steve rebranded Quantum Link with the money he received from the penalty clause, and America Online was established in 1989. At the same time, Microsoft was garnering attention as well, so Steve launched his service for DOS in 1991 and for Windows in the year after that. By 1993, AOL started granting access to the public internet. This led to an entire generation of people to use AOL, who grew up with the iconic dial-up ringtone. And the same people went on and formed the foundation of the company by being avid users. By June of the same year, AOL had garnered a massive following of 300,000 subscribers for their dial-up service. This pushed them to be the fourth largest service provider at the time. However, unlike their competition, AOL was growing exponentially on the back of their extreme marketing campaigns. The other service providers at the time were focusing on a niche audience of people who were already familiar with tech. But AOL had a different plan of action. It was focusing on people who knew nothing about tech. 
This is further strengthened by the fact that AOL would team up with news publications and services aimed at the elderly. This extensive campaign was showing them results, too. By September, AOL had amassed another 50,000 subscribers. And by January of 1994, AOL had over 600,000 subscribers. AOL was very successful, and its success was only growing. The revenue generated by AOL doubled annually, and Steve Case had a sudden influx of huge amounts of money which he didn't know what to do with. He decided to invest in the marketing team of his company led by Jan Brandt, who was one of the most skilled marketing experts at the time. Jan came up with a brilliant strategy to promote AOL. Unlike their competitors who charge for both the software and the dial-up service, AOL would offer its software for free and she'd try to push it onto as many people as possible. This idea has led to one of the most expensive marketing campaigns in history. First, she bought $250,000 worth of floppy disks and posted it to every PC user she could find the address of. But floppy disks were on their way to be replaced by CDs, so she started buying those instead and then continued her practice. Jan adopted an aggressive strategy, and for every new subscriber, she would buy even more CDs to send out, which in turn would bring in even more subscribers. And it created a huge cycle, which resulted in a massive increase in AOL subscribers. By the end of 1995, AOL had gained more than 4 million new subscribers thanks to Jan's campaign. The scale of the operation had grown so much that simply mailing the CDs wasn't enough and Jan decided to partner up various magazines, stores, and even universities all across the country to hand out AOL CDs. Now, this was a huge success as well, and not long after this, you would see AOL CDs everywhere you went. The other service providers couldn't keep up with AOL, and they tried a last resort to switch from hourly billing to a monthly subscription. But even this wasn't enough to keep AOL at bay, since AOL adopted the same strategy soon afterwards in the end of 1996. This was the final blow to their competitors, and AOL won the battle. But this switch to a monthly subscription came with a price. At the time, AOL had over 9 million subscribers, and this meant that all of them could be online at the same time since no one had to pay for every hour now and be conservative with their usage, which led to a massive overload on their servers. The infrastructure AOL was built on wasn't meant to handle traffic of this proportion, and it started crashing frequently, which led to the subscribers staring at the no signal sign on their screens. Now, even though AOL was installing more than 30,000 new modems each month, it wasn't enough to deal with the issue at hand. At last, to fix the issues related to traffic, they ended up spending $700 million, which came mostly from the marketing budget. The end of the CD campaign didn't mean that AOL stopped growing, though, and it still grew at an alarming rate. It now had more than 15 million subscribers and was the internet service provider to more than half of the U.S. citizens. To bolster their influence, they then bought ICQ, which was the most popular chatting service at the time. And in the same vein, in 1998, they bought Netscape, the most widely used internet browser at the time. Although the Netscape developers had some sort of vendetta against AOL or something, and just before the deal was finalized, they made the browser source code public. AOL was at the top of its game at the beginning of the new century. They had more than 26 million subscribers at the time, which was much more than anyone else present in the market. Unfortunately, they made a huge mistake, which would later lead to the demise of AOL. AOL signed a deal to buy Time Warner for a whopping $164 billion, which was the most striving merger of the time, in hopes of creating a tech media hybrid behemoth. However, there simply wasn't the ability to virtualize all of Time Warner's material at the time, and the merger was doomed from the beginning. The two companies were completely different, down to their work ethic, so it was impossible for the two to mesh together. The new organization was in shambles, which resulted in a huge loss of nearly $100 billion, not even two years into the deal. This wasn't a good time for AOL since Time Warner dropped AOL out of its name and AOL's dial-up service was being overtaken by cheaper and better broadband providers of the time. They couldn't stop losing subscribers, and they even made the cancellation process a huge ordeal in hopes that it would stop people from leaving. 
But that didn't work. By 2007, AOL had undergone a massive shrink and now had only 9 million subscribers and the company had fired nearly half of its workforce. Time Warner dropped out of the deal in 2009 and AOL was forced to close off its online services one by one and it was only left with 5 million subscribers by that time. They realized that advertisement was their only way out of this mess, so they followed the strategy that bought up some content sites from 2009 onwards, which include TechCrunch and the Huffington Post. After some desperate attempts in 2011, their subscriber count stabilized at just around 2 million subscribers. But this wasn't enough to sustain them for long, and in 2015, Verizon bought AOL for $4.4 billion. This was the fall from grace for AOL as it ceases to be. AOL built a massive empire over the years it functioned, but failed to adapt to the times. It failed to manage the influx of subscribers it had, which is what led to the eventual downfall of their empire. So let us know what you think about AOL and if you ever used the service while it was still in its prime. Check out some of the other videos on our channel, and I'll see you next time.